dear compatriots and friends, on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party of China this July, it is appropriate to take stock of what the Philippine National Democratic Movement has learned from China and the CPC inasmuch as China, before its national liberation in 1949, had semi-colonial and semi-feudal conditions like the Philippines today and had to wage a revolution with two stages, the first stage being the new democratic revolution and the next being the socialist revolution. The Philippine National Democratic Movement has learned so much from the Chinese revolutionary experience in adopting the universal theory of the proletariat, particularly the development of Marxism, Leninism, to Mao Zedong thought or Maoism, realizing the ideological, political, and organizational leadership of the proletariat through the Communist Party of the Philippines and setting forth the general line of People's Democratic Revolution with a socialist perspective and waging a protracted people's war. The Philippine Revolution has gained a great deal of positive lessons from the struggles, sacrifices, and victories of the Chinese proletariat and people, and from the leadership of the Communist Party of China and Mao Zedong from 1921 to 1976, through such periods as the initial work among the workers, peasants, and the intelligentsia, the Northern Expedition, the Agrarian War, the war against Japan, the subsequent civil war, the period of reconstruction and consolidation, the basic socialization of the economy, the great leap forward, the socialist education movement, and the, and the great proletarian cultural revolution. But alas, since the Dengist counter-revolution in October 1976, China has overthrown the socialist class rule of the proletariat, removed from the Communist Party and the socialist state, the proletarian revolutionaries who followed the leadership of Comrade Mao and had carried out the great proletarian cultural revolution. Since the third plenum of the 11th Central Committee of the CPC in 1978, bourgeois principles, policies, and measures have been formally adopted to carry out the rapid restoration of capitalism leading ultimately to the rise of China as a capitalist and imperialist power. Mao's greatest contribution to the development of Marxist-Leninist theory and practice is his theory and practice of continuing revolution under pro the proletarian dictatorship through cultural revolution in order to combat revisionism, prevent capitalist restoration, and consolidate socialism. Even if the GPCR was defeated in 1976, like the Paris Commune in 1871, it has succeeded in posing the problem of modern revisionism and capitalist restoration in socialist society and put forward the basic principles and methods of combating revisionism and consolidating socialism. The success of the Dengis counter-revolution in overthrowing proletarian rule and restoring capitalism confirms the validity and correctness of the Maoist theory and practice of the GPCR. Both China and the Philippines heard the salvos of the October Revolution and stood to benefit from the emergence of the first socialist state, and Lenin initiated in 1919 the establishment of the Third International in order to promote the World Proletarian Revolution, he recognized the important role that the oppressed peoples and nations could play in this revolution. When the Russian Revolution could not be followed up by the German Revolution, he thought that the World Proletarian Revolution could be done through Beijing, if not through Berlin. The Chinese Revolution had to be carried out according to the concrete conditions of Chinese society. The May 4th movement of 1919 arose because China was being subjected to arrangements made by the imperialist victors in the World War I uh, in favor of Japan at extreme cost to the national sovereignty of the Chinese people. 
The resistance of the people immediately caught the attention of the Bolsheviks and the Comintern. Thus, they moved promptly to encourage the establishment of the CPC as early as 1921. In the Philippines, it took a bit longer time to establish the Communist Party of the Philippines in 1930 under the auspices of the, the American Communist Party within the Comintern framework. China has had the advantage of being geographically close to the Soviet Union. Thus, it became possible for Stalin to encourage the alliance of the CPC and the Kuomintang and to supply weapons for the northern expedition against the northern warlords from 1925 to 1927. Chiang Kai-shek would betray the alliance, but the entire regiments led by, com by communist cadres would break away from the National Army and their first tendency was to engage in urban uprisings. It was Mao who showed the way in the Agrarian War in Shinkansan how to defeat three Kuomintang campaigns of encirclement with counter-encirclement by guerrilla warfare and regular mobile welfare in the countryside. But the so-called Bolshevik group headed by Wang Ming came to Shinkansan under the authority of the common turn misdirected the People's Army towards adventurous actions, caused severe damage to the revolutionary bases that necessitated the long march. In the face of the grave uh, errors committed, the leadership of Mao Zedong was upheld at the Zunyi Conference in 1935. Upon the arrival of the Red Army at Tiananmen, uh, Mao engaged in the ideological and political consolidation of the CPC and the Red Army. By 1936, the imminence of Japanese aggression became apparent and under the encouragement of the Soviet Union, the CPC engaged the Kuomintang in alliance against the Japanese aggression from 1937 to 1945. By excelling at fighting the Japanese aggressors, the CPC and its Red Army gained unprecedented strength. The U.S. brought into China some three divisions and at the same time sued for peace between the CPC and the Kuomintang in order to make the latter gain the upper hand. Stalin himself cautioned against the liberation of the entire China by the CPC. Under the leadership of Mao, the CPC joined the Chongqing peace negotiations but observed the aggressive scheme of the U.S. and the Kuomintang preparations for civil war. The Red Army was ready for liberating the entire country from 1946 to 1949. In the case of the Philippines, the merger party of the Communist Party and the Socialist Party failed to develop a nationwide anti-fascist movement under the auspices of the Popular Front from 1936 onward and was confined to Metro Manila, Central Luzon and Southern Luzon. It also failed to develop the People's Army against Japan beyond the confines of these three regions from 1942 onward. Because of the metaphysical notion that control of these regions meant control of Luzon and therefore of the whole country. Worse, the right opportunist errors of the Vicente Lava leadership actually prevented the expansion of the Hukbalahab. The errors ranged from the retreat for defense policy from 1942 to 1943 to the policy of welcoming the return of U.S. imperialist forces and the Commonwealth puppet government from September 1943 onward. The old merger party of the CP and SP did not maximize the favorable conditions for building the People's Army and carrying out land reform nationwide during the World War. Neither was it able to take advantage of the revolutionary flow that appeared in mainland Asia in the decades that followed World War II because of subjective factors like the left opportunist error of Jose Lava, which had the putschist aim of seizing political power in two years' time from 1949, and the right opportunist errors of Jesus Lava in liquidating the People's Army in 1955 and the party in 1957, and because of objective conditions like the archipelagic character of the Philippines. The armed revolution in the Philippines was practically defeated from 1950 onward after the 1949 offensives 
and the arrest of the entire Manila-based Politburo of the old merger party. After nearly two decades, the People's Democratic Revolution would be earnestly resumed upon the re-establishment of the CPP on December 26, 1968, and founding of the New People's Army on March 29, 1969. Being in an archipelagic country like the Philippines, the NPA has not been able to benefit from cross-border assistance like the People's Armies of Korea and Indochina after World War II. But of course, the Filipino people and revolutionaries have always been inspired and emboldened by the revolutionary struggles and victories on the Asian mainland. And it was a sad development that from 1978 onward, the Chinese counter-revolutionaries restored capitalism and proceeded to discourage the revolutionary armed struggles in Southeast Asia in the name of regional peace and development and good relations with the U.S. and the ASEAN. Despite this dismal turn of events, the CPP has brilliantly overcome all U.S.-supported strategic campaigns of military suppression against the armed revolution from the time of Marcos to the present and has developed this nationwide and with deep roots among the toiling masses of workers and peasants by building the party, the People's Army, with auxiliary and reserve forces, revolutionary mass organizations, alliances, and the local organs of political power. There are two important lessons learned by the Filipino revolutionaries from the Chinese Revolution and Mao. One is to apply materialist dialectics and fighting and seizing arms from the enemy by following the strategic line of protracted people's war. And the other lesson is the principle of self-reliance. Thus, the CPP has been able to carry out and advance the People's Democratic Revolution for 52 years despite major setbacks of the world proletarian revolution due to the concatenation of counter-revolutionary developments such as anti-communism, neo-colonialism, modern revisionism, neoliberalism, the full restoration of capitalism in Russia and China, and recrudescent uh, fascism. The Philippine Revolution is now a torchbearer and frontliner in the world proletarian revolution. Wishing to complete its victory over revolutions guided by Marxism-Leninism, the U.S. wants to destroy the CPP and the armed revolutionary movement. Exposing its own imperialist character, China has violated Philippine sovereign and maritime rights in the West Philippine Sea and competes with the U.S. in plundering the Philippines. Notwithstanding all these, the Philippine Revolution stands to benefit from its self-reliant fortitude and from the wide-scale anti-imperialist and democratic mass struggles which are ushering in the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution. The People's War in the Philippines is still in the stage of the strategic defensive with the multiplication of platoons and companies as the fighting units to carry out extensive and intensive guerrilla warfare, bleed the enemy monster with thousands of wounds, mature the final phase of the strategic defensive, and prepare for the stage of the strategic stalemate with companies and battalions as the fighting units in waging regular mobile warfare. The success of the strategic stalemate will further prepare the strategic offensive for defeating the enemy nationwide and bringing, out about, bringing about the basic completion of the new democratic revolution through the seizure of political power in the cities. As we have learned from the Chinese revolutionary experience, we can advance in the People's Democratic Revolution only by strengthening the CPP as the advanced detachment of the proletariat carrying out the armed struggle and realizing the united front that arouses and mobilizes the people in their millions and to advance the armed struggle as the main form of revolutionary struggle we need to integrate it with the agrarian revolution and with building the revolutionary mass base consisting of the local party branches units of the people's army the People's Militia, the revolutionary mass organizations, and the local organs of political power constituting the People's Democratic Government. Insofar as we have not yet completed the People's Democratic Revolution 
and have not yet started the socialist revolution, we have to learn in advance what essentially is to be done in the future by studying the history of the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. In the current forum, however, I'm, re I'm assigned to relate the Philippine National Democratic Movement to China. I feel obliged to discuss the socialist perspective of this movement and the necessary relations of socialism in China with that in the Soviet Union since the victory of the Chinese Revolution in 1949. We all know that in the period of consolidation and reconstruction from 1949 to 1952, China had to engage the cooperation and assistance of the Soviet Union in facing up to the continuing imperialist and Guomindang threats to China, as well as to the U.S. war of aggression in Korea. Even as they were self-reliant, the Chinese proletariat and people learned much from the Soviet experience in overcoming the cost of the civil war and the imperialist blockade, stabilizing the economic and political situation, overcoming inflation and corruption, suppressing counter-revolutionaries, nationalizing the land and completing the land reform, and com preparing the basic socialization of the economy. In the basic socialization of the economy from 1953 to 1957, the Chinese socialist state continued to own, control, and operate the commanding heights of the economy, the major industries, lines of transport, and sources of raw materials confiscated from the foreign capitalist and bureaucrat capitalist. As in the period of the new economic policy in the Soviet Union, concessions were given to the national bourgeoisie, which was accommodated in state private corporations. Small producers and traders were also allowed to operate. Cooperatives were promoted among the peasants who benefited from land reform, as well as among other small producers in handicrafts and other enterprises. But when the time came for the great leap forward for building the agricultural communes as the highest stage of agricultural cooperation and as the base of the entire economy, the heavy and basic industries as the leading factor and light industry as the bridge, the brazen right opportunist as well as the more subtle revisionist under the influence of Soviet revisionism as well as a petty bourgeois background manifested their opposition. The CPP, under the leadership of the Great Mao, succeeded in building the commune system and the industrial foundation of socialist China and overcame the imperialist blockade, the Soviet abandonment of projects, the natural calamities and the sabotage by the rightist and revisionist. After the overall success of the Great Leap Forward and bumper crops of 1962, the CPC, under the leadership of Mao, launched the socialist education movement in order to confront the pernicious elements who had attacked the Great Leap Forward and the CPC under the leadership of Mao. But those of the CPC Central Committee who had opposed the Great Leap Forward and wished to perpetuate and enlarge the concessions of the bourgeoisie sabotaged the socialist education movement and continued to protect those making propaganda against the line of socialist revolution. Thus Mao and his proletarian revolutionary comrades decided to launch the great proletarian cultural revolution and start with the bombardment of the bourgeois headquarters of Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping and the CPC by the Red Guards in 1966. Since the ascendance to power of modern revisionism under Khrushchev and the Soviet Union in 1956, Comrade Mao had seriously studied this phenomenon, its nature, causes, and consequences in socialist society. Thus, he was able to develop the theory and practice of continuing revolution under the dictatorship of the proletariat through cultural revolution in order to combat modern revisionism, prevent the restoration of capitalism, and consolidate socialism. He was for the revolutionization of the superstructure, doing away with the anti-socialist old ideas, culture, customs, and habits in order to uphold the revolutionary leadership of the proletariat and enhance the socialist relations of production. Class struggle was proclaimed as the key link in the advance of socialist society, putting revolutionary politics in command of production and not merely developing the forces of production. 
As a result of the GPCR, the youth were mobilized as Red Guards, as revolutionary successors in combination with the toiling masses of workers and peasants. Art and literature were revolutionized to serve the people and honor the revolutionary workers, peasants and soldiers as the heroes. The theatrical models were promoted. The educational system was reformed to stop the phenomenon of university students coming mostly from former exploiting classes and from strata higher than those of the workers and peasants. Barefoot doctors were trained to spread and raise the level of health care in the rural areas. Revolutionary committees were created as new organs of political power. Three-in-one leading committees were formed in the factories, communes and institutions to combine the representatives of the party, the masses and, ex and the experts. The Ansan uh, constitution became the model for organizing the workers. The Tachai and Tachai models were promoted. The first half of the 10-year course of the GPCR was generally successful, but the blatant revisionist capitalist traders were, were able to unite with the centrist and together they succeeded to split the ranks of the left and bring back Deng Xiaoping and other capitalist rotors to power under the pretext of their having become repentant and rehabilitated. Increasingly, they were able to use the line against Soviet modern revisionism and social imperialism to justify rapprochement with U.S. imperialism in connection with the catchwords of modernization, reforms, opening up, and reintegration in the world capitalist system in order to obfuscate the line of class struggle. They put forward a theory and line of developing the productive forces using diplomatic and trade relations with the, the capitalist countries to hasten access to higher technology, doing away with the class struggle as the key link and trashing proletarian internationalism. Matters came to a head in the year of 1976. After the death of Zhou Enlai, his longtime protege Deng Xiaoping was removed from power as an exponent of big comprador ideology with his line of modernization through capitalist reforms and reintegration into the world capitalist system. But after the death of Mao in September 1976, it was the turn of the Dengist and centrist followers of Zhou Enlai to enable the Dengist counter-revolutionary coup. The mass arrest of the followers of Mao and the mass expulsion of CPC cadres and members who had supported the GPCR. Those who opposed the GPCR were brought back to the CPC en masse and took over the leading positions. Thus the CPC became a revisionist and phony communist party. In the third plenum of the 11th uh, CPC Central Committee in 1978, decisions to adopt capitalist reforms, reintegrate China and the world capitalist system, and restore capitalism completely in China under the guise of socialist market, market economy and socialism with Chinese characteristics. The GPCR was declared a complete catastrophe despite the average yearly economic growth rate of more than 10% during the period. The commune system was dismantled and the rural industries were privatized. The big bourgeoisie was rewarded with further repayment of war bonds already previously redeemed by the state and was given access to the state banks to take credit and expand their private business operations. In 1979, the U.S. started its diplomatic relations with China after making preparations for these since uh, the Nixon visit to China in 1972. U.S. and China carried out in earnest their partnership in promoting the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization in the 90s onward. But being cautious in giving concessions to China and pressuring it to bend further, the U.S. promoted sweatshop operations in China, the delivery of low-end technology and Chinese exports of garments, shoes, and other consumer goods to the U.S. market. By 1989, the inadequacies of the U.S.-China economic relations showed with the rise of mass discontent against flagrant corruption and inflation in China. 
Consequent to the mass uprisings in Beijing and many other Chinese cities in 1989, China, under the paramount leadership of Deng, begged the U.S. to grant more economic concessions to China and promised to further liberalize the entry of U.S. and other foreign investments and open special economic zones. In turn, the U.S. demanded that China join the World Trade Organization and open further the Chinese economy. China joined the WTO in 2001 and the U.S. and China became undoubtedly the main partners in promoting and carrying out the neoliberal uh, policy. Since then, the economic growth of China accelerated on the capitalist road to become the largest capitalist power after the U.S. To make uh, monopoly capitalism dominant in China, the phony Communist Party and the monopoly bureaucrats have plundered the social wealth created by the Chinese working people under the red flag of socialism and have submitted the working people to extreme conditions of exploitation, mass poverty and deprivation. The dismantling of the commune system drove great numbers of peasants to urban poverty and exploitation by Chinese and foreign companies. The abolition of the right to strike and the lack of labor rights have generalized the, nine, uh, the 996 rule of wage slavery, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. work for six days a week, reminiscent of early 19th century England. Even the highly educated white collar employees are subjected to this rule. Gross inequality and social injustice reign in China. State monopoly capitalism has served to accelerate strategic, economic, and military production and to expand private monopoly capitalism to the extent that this has become larger in share values than the state sector. Shares of stocks in state corporations as well as in state private corporations are publicly traded and acquired by private stock owners. As of 2003, according to a survey report done by the OECD, the private sector share in value added in the entire Chinese economy was already 59.2% and was growing at an accelerated rate since the 1990s. As of 2015, according to the Huron report, China outstripped the U.S. in the number of billionaires. Millionaires and billionaires like Jack Ma of Alibaba are highly honored members of the CPC. In the National People's Congresses of 2016, more than 100 delegates were billionaires in U.S. dollars like Pony Ma of 10%, Robin Lee of Baidu, and Kei Jun of uh, Xiaomi and 209 other delegates had net assets above 2 billion yuan or 300 million US dollars. In the US Congress at the time, there was no billionaire and the richest was California Republican Daniel Issa, who had as net worth only 440 million dollars. Members of the CPC Central Committee have generally concealed their private assets. But immediate and close relatives have openly become millionaires and billionaires with uh, large shares of stocks in major private corporations in real estate, technology, energy, manufacturing, commerce, banks, and finance. The big bourgeoisie is flagrantly in power, the CPC and the state, and in the big private corporations. Corruption has been so rampant in the CPC and the state that President Xi Jinping has so prominently crusaded against it. But Quora researchers point out that the sister of Xi, uh, Qi Chao Chao, has accumulated assets of more than uh, 1.7 billion US dollars. State monopoly corporations have been intertwined with private monopoly corporations and even sell shares of stocks to big private capitalists. Take a look at the list of the 500 largest private uh, Chinese uh, private corporations. Let me just mention here the 10 with the largest capital, Huawei in electronics, Pacific Construction Group, Amer International Group in metals, 
Hengli Group in Chemicals, Country Garden Holdings in Real Estate, Evergrande Group in Real Estate, Legend Holdings in Electronics, Gome Holdings uh, Group in Retail, China Banke Company Limited in Real Estate, and Geely Holding Group in Motors. Huawei's largest capital is 858 billion yuan or 126 billion dollars and Gilis is 330 billion yuan. The 10 largest private banks of China are China Merchants Bank, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, Bank of China, Agricultural Bank of China, China Construction Bank, China International Capital Construction, Bank of Communications, Shanghai Pudong Development Bank, China City uh, Bank and China Minxing Bank. The following are the five largest private insurance companies. China Life Insurance Company, Ping An Insurance Group, China Pacific Insurance Group, People's Insurance Company of China, and New China Life Insurance. When the crisis of overproduction and financial crash of 2008 occurred, the U.S. still praised China for making the world economic growth rate stay above zero. But in the further years with the so-called Great Recession threatening to become the Great Depression worse than the one in the 1930s, the U.S. has become critical of the Chinese two-tiered economy of state monopoly capitalism and private monopoly capitalism. Manipulative and unfair trade and currency policies theft of U.S. technology and build-up of military power. Openly wary of China's economic and military rise, Obama announced the policy of strategic pivot to East Asia and exclusion of China from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, where China pushed uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership to exclude the U.S. and the far larger and more ambitious Belt and Road initiative. Trump became more aggressive against China and designated it as the main economic competitor and political rival of the U.S. He declared a trade war and restrictions on technology transfer against China. The U.S. is determined to cut down the export surplus that China has enjoyed since the 1980s and used to buy U.S. securities and private assets and to finance Chinese domestic and foreign investments. The U.S. and its traditional imperialist allies are transferring their manufacturing operations from China to India, Bangladesh, Thailand, and Vietnam. They are also encouraging the debtor countries in the BRI to declare debt defaults. The current U.S. President Biden is invoking multilateralism in the G7 and NATO in order to put China in a corner. Exposing its own imperialist character, China continues to claim sovereignty over 90% in of the South China Sea in violation of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the 2016 landmark decision by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in favor of the Philippines against China. The U.S. is taking advantage of this Chinese overreach in order to reinforce U.S. relations with the coastal countries of uh, uh, Southeast Asia and its traditional imperialist, imperialist allies. Against the Chinese claim violating the UNCLOS, the Quad of the U.S., Japan, Australia, and India uh, is uh, asserting the right of free navigation in the Indo-Pacific Oceanic Route and the European countries are also defying China's aggressive violation of the UNCLOS. The crisis of the world capitalist system is rapidly worsening. It is characterized by overproduction of all types of goods due to the rising social character of production, the extreme greed of the monopoly bourgeoisie, and the sinking wages under the neoliberal policy regime. As of 2020, the wealth of 2,153 billionaires is equivalent to what 4.6 billion people or 60% of humankind own. 
The class struggle is intensifying in the entire world in both imperialist and underdeveloped countries. The struggles of the oppressed peoples and nations for national and social liberation are rising on the widest scale, and the contradictions among the imperialist powers, especially between the U.S. and China, are sharpening. The rapid spread of anti-imperialist and democratic mass struggles are the prelude to the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution. Until recently, some 10% of the Chinese population have been enjoying relatively comfortable incomes and a high standard of living, but mass poverty among the toiling masses and among most of the youth is still a, a conspicuous fact, despite the claims that some 850 million people have just been lifted up from absolute poverty by capitalism. At least 60% of the people or more are suffering from the pangs of poverty and deprivations due to a low average monthly income of only uh, 150 US dollars. All the ills that afflict capitalist society are conspicuous in China, such as bureaucrat cor bureaucratic corruption, persistent poverty, prostitution, drug addiction, gambling, and common criminality. Thus, many Chinese youth and workers are becoming rebellious and are reading the works of Kamran Mao for inspiration and guidance. Under the stress and strain of the crisis of overproduction in the world capitalist system, the growth rate of the capitalist economy has gone down significantly since 2015, and the Chinese stock market fell by at least 14% in 2018. It remains to be seen how much damage to the Chinese economy can be done by the U.S. and its traditional imperialist allies in the years to come. Prognosticators observe that uh, China is facing tremendous odds in rising from its current position of being number two largest capitalist economy to number one and is in danger of falling into the prolonged stagnation like that of Japan since 1990. China is sitting on mountains of public and private debt uh, and inflated assets uh, like Japan in the 1980s. Under the current conditions of gross inequality, social injustice, and continuing polarization, there is a high potential for social revolutionary movement among the youth and the toiling masses of workers and peasants. There is an increasing number of the people who are reading and studying the works of Kamran Mao for revolutionary inspiration and guidance. This growing trend is being counteracted by constant surveillance, arrest and imprisonment, imprisonment of suspected Maoist by the phony communist of capitalist and imperialist China. The class struggle is definitely resurgent in China today and in the years to come. Thank you.